a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea, on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out from sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. And when the sun was up, it was scorched. Wait, are you and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground and did yield fruit, that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, and some sixty, and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that has ears, let him hear. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked him of the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. That seeing they may see, and not perceive. And hearing they may hear, and not understand. But at any time, they should be converted. And their sins should be forgiven. Wow. And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear, with what measure you meet. It shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear, shall more be given. For he that has, to him shall be given. And he that has not, from him shall be taken, even that which he has. And he said, So the kingdom of God is if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knows not how. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle, because the harvest is come. And he said, Where unto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when it is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up, and becometh greater than all herbs, and shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. Glory to Jesus. The Word tells us that God so loved the world, and He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe he is condemned already. Verse 18 says, Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, and this is the condemnation. Light has come into the world, and men love darkness. What does John 3.19 mean when it says, Light has come into the world? It means because you're made in the image of God, you have a conscience, you have a moral compass, you have the ability to judge between right and wrong. But this is not the reason why we're justified before God on Judgment Day. It says that this is why we're condemned. Because it says we see the light, Practicing evil hates the light. So it's not even that we're really neutral, right? We might treat Christ or the gospel apathetically because we have a fear of man, usually. But it doesn't mean that we're really apathetic towards Christ and our soul or in our sin, we hate God. Everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who does what is right comes to the light that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. The word says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means nobody out here is better than anybody else. We're all under judgment. It says that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Free gift. So why is it in Matthew 7 that it says that people are entering into heaven if it's a free gift? What gift has to be received? In Luke 24, 47, it says to go out and preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
there's a false gospel in America that says because you've heard the gospel, you know Jesus, or maybe even believe in your mind that he died on the cross for sins, I'm good. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, go out and preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Repentance is to have a change of heart. Before you're walking in the light of Christ, walking by His Spirit, perhaps you think you're good enough, or that Jesus died on the cross, so now I have a license to sin, right? He paid for the sin already, so I'm good. He paid for past, present, and future sins. I have a license to sin, right? That's not walking in the light. That's not repentance. Walking apart from Christ in an unrepentant heart would say, would make light of sin. But having a repentant heart is when we're broken before God. It means that I have a change of direction. It means if I'm going down one way on the street, I turn around and I'm going the other way. Before I'm walking contrary to the, the Word of God, I'm walking in pride. Not walking in line with the Word of God, I'm walking in humility. It's having a change of heart. In Ezekiel 36, 26, the Word tells us that God will take a heart of stone and He'll give us that heart of flesh. See, repentance is only part of salvation, right? We still have to have faith. In Galatians 3, it says that we don't receive the Spirit by works, but it is by the hearing of faith. So even now, this seed is being planted in your heart. The Word says that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And we're preaching the Word of God. And so what are some things in this world that will come contrary to that faith that's being sown in your heart that will lead you to everlasting life. One of them is doubt. Another is fear. Another is the flesh. It's probably the biggest. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. The pride of life. Another is pride. We don't like walking in humility because to walk in humility, you have to walk in brokenness. And that doesn't feel good. I know what it is to walk in pride. You listen to certain kind of music or maybe you just, uh, I don't know, drink something to give you a lot of energy feeling strong, you're feeling superior, that's just a good feeling to walk around like that in the world. You know, you feel superior to everyone and everything. And so it doesn't feel good to do the opposite, right? To walk in humility. It's like, now you're walking around as a, as a servant? And that's kind of hard to do. But that's what Jesus did. He was the creator of the world who made everything, who is actually worthy to be served like a king, right? He came off the throne to take on the form of a servant. So that's one of the things that could take away the seed of faith that's being sown in a person's heart. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am lowly and meek, or I am humble and gentle at heart. Man, that's still amazing. Even when I say it, every time I look at it, that the creator of the universe that made all this beauty, that made bears and lions, and huge uh, uh, animals that are powerful, right? Created the stars and huge redwood trees and controls the seasons and can make tidal waves and earthquakes and tornadoes. He says at heart, his inner person is humble and gentle. That's a beautiful God we serve, a God of love. The word says in 1 John 4, 8 that God is love. Satan has twisted the meaning of love, especially in our society. Society will tell you that tolerance of sin is love. That is not love. Tolerance of sin is not love. It might be apathy. You really don't care about somebody. You just want to get get by. You'll say, oh, let them do what they want. It's It's apathy. It's not love. But true love, it says love suffers. First thing it says that love does. Love suffers long and is kind. You know that Jesus hung at least six hours on the cross. After that, he said, Father, forgive them. I can't, I can't imagine. You're trying to love these people, and they're just being spiteful and proud, and then they mock you, and they spit on you, and then they see you hanging on the cross. You didn't do anything wrong, and you're doing it because you love them. And after all that, he said, Father, forgive them. But they don't know what they're doing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek itself. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness or iniquity. So that means if sin is happening, then love is not happening. They're fundamentally opposing forces like light and dark, love and sin. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but love rejoices in the truth. 
the love bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away. For now we see dimly, as through a darkly stained glass, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then we shall know just as we all also are known. And now abide faith, hope, and love. These three. Faith, hope, love. But the greatest of these is love. Meaning even like some special knowledge and wisdom, that's going to pass away. It's temporary and it's for this world. But it says the three eternal things that will never do away. Eternally divine is faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of those three superior divine attributes of God is love. And that's why Jesus died on the cross for sins with love for you. Personally, he, the word says that he knows us. He knows everything that we've done, what we're doing, what we're going to do. He knows when we lie down, we rise up. He knows our coming and our going before there's a word on our tongue. Behold, he knows it all together. That he's intimately acquainted with all our ways. He examines our thought from afar. That means last week he knew what we would be thinking right now in this moment. He was pondering it. It says in uh, Psalm 139, 17, How precious are your thoughts towards me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should be able to number them, they're more than the grains of sand. How precious are your thoughts towards me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should be able to number the thoughts of God about me, they're more than the grains of sand. Imagine the number of grains of sand there are on all the beaches in the world. And it says that God has more thoughts than that about you. Not us as a whole, as a group, as a collective, but you individually. He knows the things that you've suffered when you were younger. He knows the things that you're suffering now. He knows the part of you that you're hiding from others. Not anxiety. Maybe anxiety. It could be hopelessness. God knows that part of you. And that's the part that the Lord wants to minister to. But it says that He doesn't force us. Right? We can continue going in the direction we're going because that's like Him honoring us. He respects us enough to give us autonomy and our, our free will. We can literally mock God. Right? That's how much He gives us the honor of free choice. We can mock Him. We can use His name as a cuss word. That's the most popular cuss word out here. It's crazy. I don't even hear people blaspheme Allah or Buddha or blaspheme somebody else. They blaspheme Jesus. That's the one name they people choose to blaspheme. That should set alarms in your mind, in your heart. But that's evidence of people's hatred towards God. If they would choose that one name out of all the millions of names. There's like a million Hindu gods. No one's blaspheming the Hindu gods. But they'll, they'll specifically choose out that one name. The one, the one person who died for their sins, that's who they're going to bless him. So you can see the hardness and ridiculousness of the human heart apart from God. But the opposite of love is like insanity. It's callousness. It's pride. It's everything that we actually hate deep down. That's what we actually turn into. We actually become those things that we despise or apart from God. But we love you. We seriously love you. Yeah, Jesus loves you more. Let's my friends. So, yeah, we're out here because we love you. We have a desire that you guys enter into our eternal life. We're out here because we know that God is holy. And that holiness is terrifying. Remember the entire world that was destroyed with a flood? You know, only eight people were saved. I mean, imagine a world with eight billion people. Just say 800,000 were saved, or even eight million were saved. And the rest died. While God destroyed whole cities like Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. That, the word says that God did that as an example for those that afterwards should live on God. That's us. We're not to copy what Sodom and Gomorrah were doing. We're to look at what happened when God did to Sodom and Gomorrah and be smart, to be intelligent. And say, okay, this is how God feels about this sin. So let's not throw parades for it, and let's not teach our children it. That's what a smart, intelligent, humble 
rational soul would do. He said that God's holiness is terrifying because it says he even cast down the angels that sin. He's reserving them right now in chains of darkness for the day of judgment. And so we're not to, even though we might, some part of us, recognize the tenderness and compassion of Christ, we're not to divorce that from His holiness. And really, the healthy, a healthy reverence from God can really only happen when we receive God's Holy Spirit. In Acts 7, before Stephen was killed, he said that you do always resist the Holy Ghost. It's something they were actively doing day after day. They would do it one day, go to sleep, wake up, do it another day, resist the Holy Ghost. Continue on in pride and lust, go to sleep, wake up again, resist the Holy Ghost. Stephen was reasoning with them. He reasoned with them day in and day out in the synagogue before he came to that point. And then he finally saw, it doesn't matter how much I love these people and how much I reason with them. The fact of the matter is they're resisting the very Holy Ghost. That's when they gnashed their teeth, they covered their ears, they dragged him out the city and they stoned him. And even after all that, Stephen was doing all of this in love. He said, Father, don't hold this sin against them. This is the love that God has for us, that he would reason with us in our soul, day in and day out, and we would resist him in pride. In a spiritual sense, it's like we're sitting on his lap and slapping his face. It's like he's giving us all these blessings, right? He's giving us air to breathe. He's giving us companionship, he's giving us clothes, he's giving us a mind that can make money, so that we can taste for it, so that we can enjoy food. But just doing all these things that God has, all these pleasures that God made, and then like cursing him, and hating him. And it's like, this is a shadow of heaven. The pleasures we experience in this life is a shadow of the pleasures we're going to experience in heaven. So that's why God says, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? It's so foolish to, to live for the, like, the shadow of pleasure. When God said that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. All the pleasures that we experience in this world, the most intense, satisfying pleasure you can experience in this world, is a shadow of the pleasure that's in heaven. So that's why God says, repent. And the same thing is true about pain in hell. The most extent, uh, a painful, intense pain you've ever felt here on earth is a shadow of the pain, intensity in hell. It's all a shadow. And so we're, we're heading in a certain direction. It's either we're heading towards Christ in heaven and eternal life and that eternal pleasure that you cannot fathom, or we're away from Christ towards Christ. Or try to point to a different God and say, well, no, I'm going to this God so that all bad doesn't apply to me. Right? That's covering our sins. It says, if we confess our sins, 
Now He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us. A lot of, some preachers might leave this part out, but cleansing of sin. It's like, okay, in a spiritual sense, or imagine you just got done a long day, right? You had this long hot day, all this smoke on you, still all grimy, and you, and you go take a shower, right? You're cleansed. Well, that's what it means to be cleansed from sin. You know, you have all this grime, spiritually speaking, from the world and your own sin. You feel some kind of way, you feel dirty, and then you confess your sins, the Lord forgives you, then He cleanses you from all unrighteousness. It's like you're given a spiritual shower where you feel fresh and clean and whole and pure without the condemnation or the depression or the guilt or the despair. Instead, the Lord replaces it with joy, peace, hope, life, life, love. And that's why we're out here, because these things are only in Jesus. He is these things. He is all these things. And there is no love apart from Jesus. You know? The Greek had four different words for love. Oh, yeah. Okay? They had phileo, which is brotherly love, right? You can have that kind of affection for somebody. And they had storgi, which is familial love, that's like, or protective love, right? This love we have, like, a, a father might have for his daughter. It's a storgi. Or there's eros, which is a romantic love, right? From a man and a woman, eros. And then there's agape, which is God's love, or sacrificial love. And that's the kind of love that transcends those other three loves, that embodies them, and actually makes those other three loves good. That we're out here to present today. And that God showed this agape love for each one of us. When He sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Where it says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And really, our blood was really no good to pay for our sin. But Jesus, because He never sinned, He was born of the Holy Spirit, He was pure. He lived in the flesh. He was tempted, but he never sinned. His blood was good to cleanse us from sin. That's why we're out here. We love you. Jesus loves you. We have to repent. Luke 24, 47 says, Go out and preach repentance for the remission of sins. If you don't want to repent, you can just ask God, like, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. You know, if you go on YouTube, a lot of people actually have testimonies on YouTube. YouTube. I think I'll preach from Galatians. In their room, ask Galatians. And they just say, God, mm-hmm. if you real, show yourself to the Christian. You can do that. Okay. Or even right now, oh, no, God, no. if you real, show yourself to me. You can ask Him right now in your heart. Or you can say it out loud. A lot of people come to God just like that. Thank you. Oh, yeah, they're Christian. Okay, no. yeah, they're Christian. Okay. God is good and this life is short it says in James that this life is like a vapor imagine steam that comes from a hot cup of coffee right you barely notice it it's there for an instant and then it is no more it's gone and the word says that in the light of eternity that's what this life is like it's like a vapor that appears a little while and it is no more and the truth of the matter is we can die today Hey, that's a good song, bro. We could be standing before God before the sun goes down. That's the truth of the matter. I don't say that to scare you. I, I do say it to scare you, but only so you put your faith in Jesus Christ so you don't have to be scared to die on any day. Because there is a life. There is a hereafter. Surely there is a hereafter and your hope will not be cut off. So let your heart empty sinners. It means you go out to the world. You're not planning to want to do sin or be tempted. But it looks like what the world is doing is so good. You're like, man, your heart is envying sinners. Proverbs 23, 17. Do not let your heart envy sinners. But be in the fear of the Lord. It means recognize that there's an eternity and it's serious. All the day long. Ecclesiastes 7. Solomon, the wisest man to ever have lived after he lived his life. Yes, came to this conclusion. He says, A fool thinks only of having a good time now, but a wise person thinks much about that. It's okay to think about having a good time all the time, but it says a fool thinks only of having a good time now, but the wise person thinks much about death. It says that it's better for your heart to be in the house of mourning 
men to be in the house of feasting. For that is the hand of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Think about the light that comes to your soul when you think about death, and you think about Christ and eternity. Until then, you have to admit, you are in spiritual darkness. You didn't know what was happening. I'm talking about from personal experience. I'm talking about from personal experience. I was so confused, I was turning left and right for all kinds of spirits because I had done drugs. I didn't know what was real anymore. At one point, I was so psychotic in my drug use, I thought that I had created the world. I thought I spoke everything in existence, and I thought I spoke everyone in existence to protect me. They were all my servants. That's what I thought at one point. I'm not even kidding. And it's what happens when you take away the foundation of reality, when you divorce yourself from truth, who is God or Jesus, then now these spirits can play with you and tell you whatever. They tell you all kinds of things. That you are where you're at in life because maybe you were so good in a past life, you were reincarnated to have all this intelligence and well. Well, I don't know. They can give you all kinds of lie, lies. Or that we're ever evolving, right? And that the only reason you don't believe in Christ is because you have the superior uh, uh, spirituality, intelligence, and that they're, that's, you know, that's beneath you. Christ and the basic message of the gospel that's beneath you. They are unintended. <laughs> they are. They are unlearned, uncivilized, uncultured. You know, Satan would blind us from the beauty that's in the gospel, and he does it, you know, through our flesh or through fear. The biggest one right now, th- during this quote unquote pandemic, is fear, right? Puts it through the news, even though there's all this evidence exposing the news for lying. And that's controlling people with fear. We're not actually looking at the evidence, we're actually consumed with other things that pertain to the flesh and pleasure. And so, this we're accepting whatever information is there, we're not actually looking for what is true. Because it's much easier. Like, y'all have so much time in the day. There's, there's time you have to eat, right? You have to make money, and then, then you have to enjoy it, right? The time for looking for the truth is just not there. And that's how Satan's controlling this world. You just turn in the news, believe whatever it says, and then go on the course of Satan. It says that the whole entire world is under the sway of the wicked one. So to actually not seek the truth is to go under the sway of the wicked one. It's to go under the sway of darkness. The thing is, a current, right? If you're part of the current, you're actually causing a current to go in a certain direction. You're actually pushing people away from Christ. That's what Jesus says. He was not gathering to me, he's scattering away from me. If you have not actively been drawing people to Jesus Christ, by default, you have been pushing people away. And that's a scary thing. But that's why we're out here, because even today, you can repent. Repent to have a change of heart to be broken for sin. In Psalm 51, 17, the Lord tells us that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. It's like humility or meekness. You know, you're sorry for your sin, you confess it before God. God says that if you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. God loves you, you're precious to Him. We, we love you. So repent of your sins, put your faith in Jesus, seek the truth. Beware the flesh, it is deceptive. It says corruption is in the world through deceitful lusts. That's actually why there's corruption in the world. right? We can't point to one man and say, oh, he's the reason for COVID and global warming. He's not making the right laws. No. It says that the reason that there's corruption in the world is deceitful lusts. It's actually the flesh. And so... We want to be careful not to encourage the spirit of lust or Jezebel in this world by being unaware or blind. But know that Jesus loves you. God is real. There is truth. Right? We can agree there's truth because as soon as you say there's no truth, you're asserting that that is true, what you're saying. So it's, 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 it's illogical. I mean, it's a self-defeating statement to say there's no truth. So there's truth. It's absolute. Jesus loves you. That's true. That's that's the good thing about truth, that Jesus loves you. But there is judgment. God is holy. That's the scary part. That's a repent. But you can also be made holy, and that's by God's Holy Spirit. So bless you guys. We love you.